You, you used the word tug a few minutes ago, mm -hmm. and I, I found that really interesting because there are a few different tugs that, that I felt like I saw last night and, and in your talking about this piece, story mm -hmm. time, uh, the, the work that you've done on, on Broadway and <laughs> the showman, you know, Bill T. Yes. Jones, the showman, mm -hmm. and, and then your real engagement with ideas, so, yes. so the thinker. Mm -hmm. um, but it's I'm true. I'm interested true. In, in that. I think you described it as a, a uh, someone described it as an audacious shuttle between <laughs> Broadway and the avant-garde. No, I guess you may be right. Uh, where is home? That might be the question. Um, this piece is, a, if you will, a kind of a, in its own way, a taking stock piece. I, it occurred to me after listening to all the 90 minutes of John Cage's indeterminacy that there was a, perch, a portrait of the man uh, that sort of that came out of that exercise where the stories can be about a, a, a Buddhist story, a story about politics, a story about mushroom hunting, a story about dance, a, a funny joke or whatever. But uh, this man who was famously kind of um, poker-faced in a way about his art, I think that's fair to say, was actually revealing himself through these stories. So I said, well, just trust that talk, write your stories about things that, are, that concern you or, or, or capture your imagination. And um, trust that every night you're going to, it will not be cold, it will not be detached. It can be actually um, in line with a lot of your work, but it will be different because you will not be always in the driver's seat. And that in, in its own way is a big question for uh, men in his 60s, just turned 60s two days ago, uh, in trying to make something that's important. Don't worry about it being important, but will it be true? Now what about the menu of movements? The menu of movements and actions are in their own way a kind of compendium of works from 1979 until now. Mm -hmm. But they had to go through their own process. Each thing, which might have once had no relationship to time, or so we thought they always do, of course, but um, now has to be sort of uh, divided into units. And it gives them a kind of uh, horizontal relationship, but they might be coming from totally different concerns. That's kind of exciting to me. And I don't have to, even though I do do it sometimes, I don't have to make a relationship between this action made in 1979 between two men dancing Bill T. Jones and Arnie Zane's duet, between this movement that was made yesterday in class by Janet Wong, and the dancers uh, are, it's an exercise about articulation and spatial awareness and so on. Don't try to connect those two. Their bodies will connect it. The audience's imagination will connect it. Um, Ted Coffey, our composer's music, will, mm. will connect it. It's kind of exciting. It is exciting. Do you have, let's talk about the audience for, yes. for a minute. Um, do you have an intention for the audience in um, the experience of the 70, 61 stories, but 70 episodes? I mean, mm -hmm, we, mm -hmm. we have the clock that is present and Suddenly, I was aware it wasn't there. And <laughs> Which is all done by Kyle Maud, spinning it by chance. When it leaves, when it comes back, and I myself, you know, I have a clock. I was, I was where, where did that go? <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's wonderful, isn't it? Because I'm sitting this way and looking uh, at a clock which is over the head of the audience. That never goes away. Mm. But the one I realized behind me, it, there are times, and it's very dangerous to do this, oh, I wonder, if this story that I'm reading, which mentions time, I wonder if the clock is there or not. Mm -hmm. I don't know, uh, you know? But they know something I don't know, the audience uh, does at that moment. It's, it's, uh, it's very humbling in a way. What about the audience? As I was telling you before, my mentor in this, John Cage, his concern was primarily one of composition. It was about the act of how right. music gets right. written. Um, now, he was, he was criticized for that. You don't care about your audience. Mm. Well, he said, how can I care about them? I can't really, I can't control what they make of it. 
Now, is that a despairing statement? Maybe there is something in it. You know, I can't control this world. I can't control what you think about me and what have you. Um, and he set out to make something that would be rooted in the experience of how the sounds are arranged. And music was sounds for him. Now, I have a history of, um, I come from another tradition. You know, the, my storytelling was what my mother and father did to entertain us to tell us about our history, to warn us about things. You know how what fairy tales were about, were warning you? Some of those stories were tough. My mother, my mother tells stories of, about lynchings and about uh, the kind of inequities of class and circumstance that are almost like parables and all. They made a profound impression. Religious stories, the Bible, those stories were very, very important. Everything is allowed in story time. So my relationship to the narrative is maybe different than his. And I have been, John Cage was not a dancer. I've been a dancer. Now he lived with a very famous dancer, Merce Cunningham. Um, he was also, I don't believe, was he a showman? He, could, he, he was very, he had a wonderful personality. Mm -hmm. People loved him, he had a great laugh, he, he, was, a, he was a cook, he, uh, those things. But did he put it away before he... I think he did. Yeah. He was a very much cooler artist. Yes. Cooler. And, and in your work, mm -hmm. uh, there are, in story time, there are profoundly emotional, personal... I know, I know. Uh, and... I wonder what... Because, you know, when I'm... Moments I, that... Yeah, they, there are. They, and I'm, I'm reading his stories, and sometimes there are things that... Is, you know, a story about his mother who tells him, you know, that there was a father before a father that he knew, and but it's all stated in a very kind of uh, deadpan way. So I have to acknowledge, first of all, that this there is something going on which is thinking about the idea of indeterminacy as it originated in the mid in the mid twentieth century in John Cage's mind after the Second World War, a certain way of him responding to a very intellectual um, sort of music uh, coming from the Vienna School in the earlier part of the century, 12-tone uh, music, the whole idea of um, engagement and um, the circle of people who were saying that art, the best art, is probably not for most audiences. The best art is only for the people who make the art. Um, he was trying to real deal with these ideas, the idea of high art, and low art, all those things. I grew up in the fist of popular culture of, my, of its time, of course. Ed Sullivan show on, on Sunday night, or um, the radio, Motown, all of those things. And of course, I did have a good kind of education with the usual uh, Melville and Thoreau and all those people like that. I was fed that. It was a very high-minded time in the U.S. in terms of education. But no, I was not, uh, I didn't have a specialized knowledge. When I encountered the avant-garde, and their references were to ideas about, in Europe, ideas about philosophy and so on, in my Southern Baptist heart, trying to understand Zen Buddhism, mm. you know, what did it have to say to me? The, what is time? What is space? And, uh, imagine a world where there is no um, god uh, of fire and brimstone. Imagine a world which, in which you are responsible for your whole life from beginning to end. Imagine a world without a deity. All of those things. Big ideas. Very important. Um, imagine a world wherein, um, and this is, this is borne out, you are not your body. You know? Imagine, you know, because I grew up, I'm a black man. I, grew up in a, in a racist society. Um, and I think a lot of these people, Cage in particular, I don't think they had to think about their race. Mm -hmm. They didn't have to think about their sexuality. Did I have to? I chose to. That relationship with Arnie Zay was a very, very important relationship. This Jewish-Italian man um, meets this African-American man, and they decide they want to have this great life together and make important art and, and have experiences and so on. What was a precedent for it? In our world, there was no precedent for it. But it was a time that said, you can be whatever you want to be, now go. Just be a good person. A good person? What's a good person? Okay, am I going to take my mother's definition of a good person? 
Um, am I going to take a philosopher's impression? I have everything was being made up. Everything was provisional. Now you're also talking about a kind of intersect. You know, like you you have deity, no deity. You know, yes. That that you have a collision. You know, in in a way, or if it's not a collision, it, yeah, it, I do, it, I it's an intersection. And at and times, I, it's I think very the painful. Piece, the piece does that it's as, doing as that well now, with, isn't it? with yeah. the deep emotion. You know, mm -hmm. the the story uh, of Estelle and the baby at her breast, which yes. I remember from. Uh, I, I bowed, bowed down. down. Yeah. Oh, that's it, fantastic. In fact, as I was looking at mm -hmm. that piece and saying, is this the right piece for, for Providence? I, or at 8 a.m. in the morning, I was watching mm -hmm. a disc of the show. Which one? I bowed down? Or I, the bowed, story I, I, I bowed down. Mm -hmm. And you told that story. Mm -hmm. And my staff came into the office and I was weeping mm -hmm. because the power of that story mm -hmm. just. And, and so, hearing it last night. Right, right. It, and, and it's so wonderful to be speaking to a person who can connect the dots to a piece which is, it's not a piece that's known like Still Here or Last Supper in the Crown's Cabin or even uh, Blind Date. It's a very important piece that was, um, but you saw it, you remembered it, and then oh, you heard it. pierced by it. Uh, yeah. so, um, in a torrent of stories last night, there's something you went to. It gives me real hope about the discursive in art or what is what appears to be fleeting. Don't assume that it's fleeting. Don't assume that you know the uh, trajectory or the destination of any idea that you put out on stage. Honor them all. Mm. You asked me about the, the public. Um, I'm honoring the public by, in a way, opening a, a door a floodgate out of me and also what's on the stage and saying, and I've been looking for the right metaphor here, is it a meal? Here's a meal. Come taste whatever you like here, whatever you can taste, you know. It's all been prepared with equal amounts of consciousness and love. Um, what's mm -hmm. going to be, what's going to taste good to you and you and you? All I ask is that you give me 70 minutes where you try to relax. Don't try to make sense out of it. It will, sense will be made. As you were pierced by that story, things will happen. Some things will slide past you. You know, it's interesting, um, as I told you, I... It's really beautifully put. You know, yes. I think looking for that, I mean, the audience just arrives and, and this happens, but look at, since we're talking, mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know, looking for you to articulate that point of entry into what can be seen as a, as a very avant-garde yes. approach. Mm -hmm. um, but it's profoundly human. Everything is apparent. You all, there's no magic tricks. Okay, there's a little smoke that comes from an undisclosed undis location. There's a little <laughs> magic here. A little other. magic. Yeah. That's, but it's, that's the showman. <laughs> yeah, that's the showman. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. We should not assume that, um, that we have any secrets from you. Um, but there are things which are mysterious even to us in the evening. I wonder, uh, okay, we have these, these, these modules, these one minute modules, mm -hmm. and as I was uh, talking to a filmmaker yesterday, he said, oh, Bill T. Jones's narratives, you know, are so powerful. And I, I felt like at the point you step, you just let it wash over you, mm -hmm. that there was an arc that mm. there was a, a narrative. Do you think that narrative is in you or is it in the piece? Uh, I think it's in where the two come together. Mm. Mm. I, I wondered for you as, uh, as the you know, center stage performer whether that comes together for you. I, I, I noticed for you more that maybe almost dancing with the clock, you know, yes. it, with your stories and, and sometimes the pauses and there was just... My, my task. It was right. very... Balletic in, mm -hmm, in, mm -hmm. in those 60 seconds, but then that arc mm -hmm. that. Um, now you, you, know, you know, of course, that one of the big, for, for John Cage, the big bugaboo of Western art was this dependence on a, on a dramatic arc. He claims to have really detested uh, theme, variation, climax. Um, he, he thought that was shackles. He thought mm -hmm. that uh, the audiences had been addicted to it and he thought that makers were expected to deliver it. As a formalist structure. 
Yes, the, yeah, the, the yes. arc starts somewhere and it takes you somewhere. And he says, you know, enter anywhere. The beginning is, no one says where your beginning is, mm -hmm. and no one says where your ending is. Like life, he was very influenced by a, a, by a certain aspect of Indian philosophy that called on artists to emulate the processes of nature. And as you know, I guess nature has, that's one thing we can say about it, I don't think it's even so clearly a circle. I think it's a, a stranger shaped thing that has its own logic. And he's saying that is where an artist should look to. So tonight, well, tomorrow night, we will spin again the structure. Last night's structure had a great deal of the bells and whistles happened to fall in the second half of the, of the 70 minutes. What would your experience have been like if they had fallen in the first half? Which they did in Montclair. And, um, and do you have a sense of what the audience is experiencing? Can you, you know, sometimes on stage you, you can feel the mm -hmm. throb. Yes, um, you can, you can. Don't be sure though, because sometimes it, we say, oh, it was my greatest performance. That you might feel that, but there, you can't say everyone in the audience felt that. Yeah. That's what he was very, John Cage was really trying to uh, free us from, is that expectation. I wonder if he was trying to free us from even an expectation of connection. That part... Um, connection, audience to... Yes, to the, to the uh, creator, to the moment. Um, that uh, I don't... He, would he be concerned if he had a funny story and people didn't laugh? Mm -hmm. I mean, Does this relate at all to... Um, the story last night about the difference between hearing and listening. Yes, and very much so. That story was one that was, I, 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 I did really read in Art in America about my friend Glenn Ligon's show where the writer says that um, looking and, um, what is it, reading and looking is germane to uh, Glenn's work and it made me start thinking in one day in rehearsal, was it in Montclair or ASU, as I was watching this work, you're asking people to do a lot. You're asking people to look at this thing, and you're asking them to listen to your stories. Now, do you expect them to understand? But what is understanding? Does understanding are, uh, is looking the same thing as understanding? Is listening the same thing as understanding? Or is listening the same thing as hearing? And is looking the same thing as seeing? And when I say seeing, am I saying recognizing? I'm not quite sure, but it was a, it's provocative and it just gives me goosebumps to think about it. So why did you just say it in the middle of the piece? Just say this, you have a torrent of questions inside of you right now, Bill. Fashion them into a story. When you have them, and this is very important, the stage has to be quiet. I made a concession to that. It has to be a very simple image because I think I know something about the stories. If you have a better chance of people apprehending what is being said, if they don't have to engage so much with what they're seeing or even Ted Cox, Ted's music. Now that sounds sacrilege if you think about trying to um, de uh, uh, well de de stratify uh -huh. what uh -huh. goes on stage. Um, but I thought at that moment, when they're listening and they're seeing say, Shayla sitting on the couch, very still. They are, they are suggestible. Now that's, that is a very important word. Who, somebody might say, that's not really true, Bill. I find that I understood you best when people were running in, around the room and you were speaking in counterpoint to that. Once again, it's my assumption. Mm -hmm. but that statement was there, and I have heard people respond that they were very grateful. Some people were very grateful to hear it stated. Yes. You know, to hear me. I can't quite about. imagine the piece without it. <laughs> you know, it's, and is that a bad thing? I don't know. We have, we have built these necessary relationships, something I don't think that John Cage ever did. Some stories, some sequences are there just to pull the audience closer to, to me, to mm -hmm. us for a moment. 